What's up, climber? Get excited. We've got cardio conditioning. We've got strength training all combined. Sit low, reach high. Come on. Keep working. Keep working. Be brave. Even if you're not, pretend to be. No one can tell the difference. Act on the outside the way you want to feel on the inside. And change before you have to. These are all words from not our guest today, but these are quotations that he used as he was framing his story. And his story is a really interesting one because it's a story about people and the stories we tell ourselves and him helping us to figure out the difference between a good and a bad one and how it can help us to propel to success and prosperity. I'm Chuck Garcia. I'm the host of A Climb to the Top. Welcome to the show. And our show today is sponsored by Climber, C-L-M-B-R. Climber is the most efficient full body cardio and strength fitness machine available with instructor-led on-demand climbing and fitness classes. Key investors include Novak Djokovic, Jay-Z, and Ryan Seacrest. To learn more about Climber, go to clmbr.com. Use code CHUCK250 at the checkout to save 250 bucks for your full paid offer. Climber also offers a convenient interest-free financing option. So clmbr.com, input code CHUCK250. This cannot be combined in, uh, with other offers and valid on paid in full pricing. Our guest today is Bob Litwin. And to describe Bob, it's pretty simple. He is a leading performance coach to many Wall Street organizations, but he is also a world champion tennis player. And to have him on the show is an honor and a privilege because his words of wisdom are, are for the ages. Bob Litwin, welcome to A Climb to the Top. Oh, Chuck, thank you for having me. And I can't tell you how cool it is when you uh, reached out to me and it said you'd read my book and that really impacted on you. And then you were amazing in one email where you wrote this fantastic new story of Chuck, which was great. And I, yeah. of course I didn't know different from who you really are, but like, well done. Well, well done. thank you very much, Bob. I, to, to say that I liked your book is an understatement. I loved your book and, and it spoke to the coach and me. It spoke to, I'm a mountaineer. So it spoke to the, the, the athlete in me. But more than anything else, it's the, it's the book I wish I had read when I was coming out of college because I went to Wall Street. It's all I ever wanted to do. And why didn't I have this book then? So Bob, tell us, for, forget about the book for just a second. I want to put that aside. Tell us about Bob Litwin. Tell us who you are. Well, I, I grew up on Long Island and went I played high school sports. I was a basketball player. That was my sport. I also, in an off season, I played tennis just because I needed a sport. It wasn't really my passion. Uh, but as a good athlete, I did pretty well, especially for coming from a community where we had tennis players, where in the, in the 1960s, not that many schools even had tennis teams. And if we played a match, we often brought an extra racket for our opponent. <laughs> so... Um, but my, my emphasis was really on basketball. But even at that time, I was like always getting these stories about me that I was like underachiever, that I was uncoachable, that I didn't have good discipline. I mean, these were things that I was told by my coach or my parents. I mean, not poorly intended. Of course, the intention was to help me become those things. Mm -hmm. But I started to kind of lock down on those stories. I mean, they, they sort of were planted and I just kind of lived with them. And I went to school in Ann Arbor, Michigan, at the University of Michigan. I wanted to play basketball, but I was unable to actually find the door to walk on because they were like, you know, the guards were 6'5", 140 pounds. I was 5'11", 150. <laughs> so I, that didn't happen. I ended up, uh, because I had played in a town where tennis was pretty popular, the coach of the team asked me if I wanted to come out for the freshman team. There were freshman teams and we didn't play uh, varsity as a freshman. And I said, sure. And I went and I tried out and I was introduced to the person who turned out to be the number one recruit in my class. And I played him and I lost six love, six love in like 40 minutes, took my racket, put it in the back of my closet, didn't hit a tennis ball for five years. Wow. But, but, you know, I mean, so I wasn't really good enough to make the Michigan team. Maybe I was, but I was not a really very fierce competitor. So I thought I just walked away from it. Yeah. And one thing like 
another. I was teaching school. I ended up somehow being like drafted to be the tennis coach, but it was a private school in Manhattan where nobody was interested in sports in the seven, early 70s. <laughs> right. so nobody tried out except like two people came <laughs> to Central Park and I hit some balls with them and I kind of enjoyed it. And one thing led to another. And during the next year or two, I switched over to teaching tennis, even though I had very you know, few skills in the game. And the, what occurred for me, and this sort of led me to where I am now, a very direct line was that I would not be teaching them uh, technique or strategy because I didn't really know it in, a, in a, so any sort of like scientific way, but I would ask them questions. My, the people I was giving lessons to, I would say like, oh, that was pretty good. How, what did you do on that one? And they said, oh, I just was like really frustrated and I didn't really care. So I just swung. I said like, oh, okay, well, let's work on not really caring, which turned into acceptance. and. And I was putting out there all these ideas that were based on the student telling me, this is what I'm like feeling out here, or like, this is what I'm doing, and this is what's working, not their grip necessarily, not their stance. So my teaching, even though there were a lot of people of my age group on Long Island that were teaching tennis at that point, the early 1970s was like, tennis was like taking off. They were all like, they knew what they were doing. I didn't. And I was making up stuff all the time about like, well, you got to be more relaxed under pressure and you've got to like, you know, be okay with the fact that it's hard. And like, look at how much you're doing better today than yesterday. These were all things I was teaching, but I didn't know that they were contributing to people really getting better. I always felt like, I don't know what I'm doing. And then I read Tim Galway's book, The Inner Game of Tennis. And I thought, oh my God, wait, I'm not like totally crazy. There's another person who's doing this. And there were four or five people in the country that were teaching what became pretty much mental skills or mental toughness training. And I was just kind of in that wave. So that's how I ended up getting into tennis. And, and I, I, I want to flash forward for just a second, because the book that I am describing, so we, we can take, based on Bob's background, I want to go right to 2016, when this book is published called Live the Best Story of Your Life. And as I read the book, I thought about my education, the education of my children, and how much the emphasis on skills, skill, skills. You read this book, and all of a sudden, you begin to think, what if everyone, their skills are equivalent? Who's winning the matches? Who is making the best trades on Wall Street? What Bob describes is now the mindset, the mental thought processes of the story you tell yourself and whether or not that's going to be your best friend or your worst enemy. That was my takeaway on the book, Bob. Is that what you were intending for any of your readers or the people who, who you coach? Well, I wrote the book, Chuck, because I was only working with a very finite number of people. I had a couple of firms I was working for and then I had some private clients but the numbers were not really dramatic in terms of the potential of me making a difference in people's lives. So I mean, there were things that were happening in my life that triggered me writing the book as well. But the book was really being written so that people could coach themselves. That was what I was trying to do. Right. And mostly what I was encouraging people to do was to take a good sweep of their mind, take a good look inside and to really identify what most people know is like, you know, the stuff that interferes, like for me, if only I were X or gee, if I were more patient or if I had better focus or if I, you know, if I had better energy, or it's like, gee, it, you know, if when I was younger, I was coached or it's like people have their, their stuff, their stuff that, that is what they're telling themselves and telling other people about why they haven't climbed to the top, their top whatever their top is, right. whether it's to win a tennis match or to make a dollar or to get a good job or to have a good relationship, they had their own explanations, but they were kind of left with them. It was kind of like, you know, you and I in our business, we know like, hey, being aware is really good, but it's only the very, very, very first step. Right. Then you have to do something to change from what you're aware of to what you want to be. And did, so, you, did you find that as you were coaching people, even early on in your career, the mind was ultimately self-defeating, that, that that was the, the, the issue was not just the skills, but how these stories were, were inhibiting progress? Yes. 
Well, they were kind of interrupters. Even with people who were super, super successful, right. they had stuff that was just interfering in them being an even better version of themselves, which might equal better outcomes, right. but would mostly equal better person. Totally. And better person would likely go to better outcomes. So I always felt like these ideas, the things that people were saying, I mean, I didn't come up with the word stories, believe me, but like, I like the word stories better than goals. I like the word stories better than intention. I like the word, I just because it was flexible and soft and it could be like changed. And, and most of these stories that people had were, I would call them interrupters. They were interrupting or they were like ankle weights that slowed them down. And that if they were able to like be transparent with themselves and say, gee, if only I were this way, they could then take that if I were only this way to write that story in a very simple sentence, which is, I am X. I, I am confident versus, I don't know, I just lose confidence. Okay, well, I just lose confidence. And okay, that's your story. It's not that it's not true. It, it might be very 100% true, but it's not hardware, it's software. And, and there's no danger in writing a story of who you might become that feels like a better version of yourself you can write that story, it's fiction, it's not necessarily true when you write it, but it becomes an option that, gee, maybe I could be that way. What could I do to become that way or to become less the other way? What can I do to take one step away from my story that holds me back to a story that might drag me forward, pull me forward, push me to become a better version of myself? And it was so apparent to me that everybody I spoke to had stories. I well, mean, I was with somebody and what you're yeah. describing, Bob, is often to some people would say, you don't use this, but you hear airborne, ah, fake it till you make it. Or others will say, fake it till you not make it, fake it till you become that. But what you described is changing the mindset to make yourself believe to be intentional about the change, to believe and to act in a way that you want to be. What do you find, though, when you give that advice to many people? Do they follow that or do they fight it? Well, when, they, when we change their story from something like I'm impatient to I'm infinitely patient, they go like, right, but I'm not. <laughs> right, yeah, come on. <laughs> I'm lying to myself now. <laughs> I know you know, but could you possibly take steps in that direction? Right. And a person who says I'm impatient, they're like, well, I don't know. That's why I'm hiring you. And I'm saying like, well, if you're hiring me, I'm asking you the question like, if you were somebody who was infinitely patient, what might you do when you're feeling impatient? Well, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I could count to 10. So it's like, all right. So you do have something you might do. You could count to 10 in that moment and maybe you will be slightly more impatient. You're, you're on your way. So there are people that are resistant, but generally people don't come to me if they're resistant to doing the work. And if they're resistant, and I find that out in the first week, I basically say to them, Let's shake hands and walk away because I can't force you to do this. I can just tell you that people who do write their old story and write their new story, the hit ratio is very high on, their, on people moving in the direction of their new story. And once they start moving that way, Chuck, it's like all of a sudden it starts to flow. It becomes a much more effortless experience to take on any story, anything that you trip over in the day, any friction in your life, you can actually write a new story about it. And the fact that you're putting out the possibility allows you to start moving there. People forget, but that's why what I do as a coach, when I'm coaching people, I'm all in with them. I'm like texting them there every day. Like I'll work with people for one to three months. Every day they're hearing from me. I don't leave it up to them. I don't expect that they're going to do it on their own. I encourage it. But over a three month period, I also start to pull away so that they become self-reliant in doing the work well i felt the work was, itself is really easy it's very simple really well, I, I felt as i was reading the book this is a really interesting take on personal development because often what we do as coaches we're, we're teaching people to do something not to take something away and what i felt as i was reading the book it's as if when you use the metaphor of the ankle weights you have this enormous weight of expectations on you and as I was reading the book and going through the exercise of how to tell my own story, 
I was feeling lighter in each chapter, like something was taken away that made me more nimble and more agile because I was gaining the confidence to be able to, to believe this story that I can tell myself. Is that, did that take a long time to conclude that approach or was that just always the way you, you found that's how to do it? I think I stumbled into it in mm -hmm. that what I found out about my own like life you know, specifically tennis, but also in my career and wanting to move into a different career was that it was much easier for me to get rid of things that were interfering than to add things. Right. So if I got rid of frustration, I was freer. If I got rid of negative negativity, I was freer. It wasn't so much, oh, I'm negative, replace it with positive. It wasn't even the need to replace it with positive. It was just let me get rid of the stuff that's like slowing me down. Right. And into that vacuum, it was like there was a vacuum that was created as I was getting rid of things one by one. I, you know, like I would do something. I'd say, boy, what's it? You know, I'm so like insecure. Or am I, lo I have low self-esteem. And I would like work that and I would so sort of peel it away like a layer. And what was left in the vacuum was more presence. Right. And I had always known some idea of if you're in the present, you do better. We've learned that, you know, and we've heard about it. Eastern philosophy is like be present. but I always thought that being in the present required like doing a lot of work to get into it rather than, hey, if you get rid of past thinking and future thinking, what are you left with? You're yeah. left with right now. Bob, so, let, let's put that in for, for us tennis watchers. And I know that you have been on the Davis Cup. You are a Davis Cup champion. I suspect you have won many, let's say, won many matches, lost many matches. But in particular, when you're going into tiebreakers, for those of us that have watched Roger, Nadal, and Djokovic emerge, the great three of tennis. We watch them in the tiebreakers. We wonder what's going through their heads because they're equally skilled. There's 110 points. Each of them have won the same number of points in a match, but one of them is walking away the winner. Describe when you are at that point or when you see others, what is happening in the mind that gives you the clarity to strip away the past and be in the moment? Well, I'd like to say I can do it all the time. I mean, it, usually in a tournament, match by match, you're getting closer and closer to a really good place, I find. Mm -hmm. A place where I'm free, much freer from the results, right. for example. I mean, if I can be free from results and feeling free, then I can do what I'm capable of doing with much less tension. So as a match is progressing, it's not that I'm not conscious of the score, mm -hmm. but it's just kind of like, that's the map, sort of. The score is there. What my job is in that moment is to continue to play the point that I'm about to play. Mm -hmm. it, it's a, I mean, it sounds very simple mm -hmm. and it is very simple. But it's not easy. <laughs> well, it, it, it's simple if, if you're not, bringing other thoughts in that interfere like oh my god if i lose this point then i have to win the next point i mean like that that's toxic right. those all almost all thoughts are toxic when you're trying to fly and be free because i'm not going to win that tiebreaker if i'm playing tight unless my opponent is tighter <laughs> right? right unless they're making errors more than i'm making errors but to to actually win on the basis of what i'm doing requires that I'm free. And, and how do I get free? I get free by having done all this work of getting rid of those things that kept me from being free. Like, oh boy, last time I played a match like this, I lost. It's like that. I'm always saying when thoughts come in, they do come in. Yeah. I've, I've learned how to let go of thoughts in one or two ways or three ways. But sometimes I'm just going to say to my thoughts, like, you know, you're just an unruly neighbor walking in on me while I'm busy. I don't have time for you right now. Right. And just treating my thought as if it's like an entity pretty much dissipates the thought or reduces the thought. Right. Or if I say to myself, oh, I've got a garbage, a fake garbage pail over here that says useless thoughts on it. And I'm getting ready to serve the second point of the tiebreaker down love one. And I'm like, boy, I got to win this point. And then my mind goes like, oh, you know what? I'm going to put that thought in the garbage pail and I'll pick it up on the way off the court. Yeah, well, one of the takeaways, like, yeah, one of the takeaways like, in the book was, was, was the constant reminder, stay focused on the mission, not on the win. Mission, win. You know, it was very much that, that 
tactical mindset of don't, don't worry about the outcome, just take care of the point and the outcome will take care of itself. And I thought that was really good because part of what you described in one chapter, which I really enjoyed was called blind faith. And this oh, yeah. faith is a tough one. Can you describe, I love that. I loved all the chapters, but this one was really spoke to me because the, 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 just explain your take on this concept of faith and how important it becomes to our mindsets. Blind faith for me is all about like, you know, believing my own story that if I've come up with a good story, I'm not going to try and like blow it out that it's not really, well, it's not true. Or it's like, I don't know if I can make it happen as much as like, I've found something that makes me feel really good if I can actually be that way. Right. And, and, and I trust that if I move in that direction, things will take care of themselves. But to, I many, mean, to many people, that, I don't know if that's answering your question. Well, I, I want to get to, to more personalize it to many people that I'm sure you work with the types I do, but even people, not that we necessarily work with, stuck in their head are expectations, a, a yes. parent, a teacher, someone who has gotten into their head that may have caused that negative thought and they have trouble shaking it. They, 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 there's just always there or the fear. And you talk about fear a lot, the fear of, oh my God, what if I don't win this match? What are people going to say? I'm going to lose her. You flip that. You, you say, forget about the forget about the loss. How do you handle the loss? Speak of that, of that, the transformation of that. That's a traffic jam in my head. I'm so afraid of losing. What happens now? Well, okay. So when you notice that, if you if you're aware of that, and people are, and they try and make it go away, they try and say, like, oh, I'm really not worried. It's like I write. I write before matches, I write after matches. And so what I'm doing is I have a process, basically like an ecosystem by which I continue to improve. Right. One thing is I do something, like I'll play a tennis match or I'll meet with a client. Then I'll write about it. Then often what I do is I share it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you know I share it with my these blogs that I send out, but sometimes I just share it with other people that I'm working with saying, yeah, I'm working with this person and this is what happened and I didn't really do it that well. So I end up getting feedback from other people. And I tend to get a lot of feedback because I'm open about my own like, gee, I'm, I feel unsure or uncertain or something. And then I get feedback. Then I take that feedback and I reconcile. I reconcile that particular feedback because, oh, I can do this better next time. Then I go and do the thing again. So there's this ongoing experience of like taking a look at how I am going in, taking a look at how I did, getting some feedback. Sometimes it's very brief. It can just be an email I get from somebody that isn't even related to what's going on. It's like, oh, that fits in. But the reconciling of like, next time better. Next time I'm going to be a little bit better. And I do want to just tell really quickly, if it's okay, this thing that happened in this particular tournament I just played where... I had gone into the tournament and I was on this 28 match, 56 set winning streak since 2019, but then we didn't play for a year. So I, felt, I had like pressure in my mind about like, geez, it's like, uh, you know, I'm on the streak, I shouldn't lose. I mean, like I could get there and lose in the first round and that's not like living up to my seating. It's like, so I was worried. So I was like processing that a lot. I was writing, it was like, I wasn't really getting anywhere. I, maybe I was. But I was, I was progressing. Anyway, I get to the tournament and several things happened that I felt kept me from actually winning the semifinals, which was a really great epic match. It was great. I loved it. There was so much that I learned in it. But I, I hadn't noticed that I had some stories going on. I just didn't notice it. Even though I'm, quote, unquote, I'm the story guy, it doesn't mean I don't have bad stories. If I don't notice them, I can't do anything about it. I didn't notice that I had like written that I had exceeded my expectations before I got to the semifinals, which is an exit strategy when you're playing. It's like, oh yeah, if I don't win, it's no big deal. You know, like I don't have to put all the effort in. Not, not that you think don't put effort in, but the effort needs to be there all the time. I didn't realize that I was giving a lot of power to my opponent in thinking he was really good and comparing myself to him rather than there's my tennis game and his tennis game. And we had a match that came down to the last four points of the match. It was like dead even. So 
there was that. And then the third thing was, I didn't really identify that my fitness level was much better than my opponent, that, you know, going into the match, that, that would be something that I could use to my advantage. So, you know, here I was, you know, like with an outcome that wasn't that what I wanted, which was to win. But there was another outcome, which was great, which is like, oh, yeah, you've got to like make sure you're working. I also had an issue with humility, thinking I shouldn't ever miss a shot in the first <laughs> round, right. really. So, so now it was like, wow, going forward, I'm going to be better. This is like great that this happened because I'm going to get clear on my story about humility, which I thought I had already like handled, but right. it, it, was a, it was a root that was still deep in me somewhere. I'm going to do better on making sure that I don't ever, ever, ever allow myself to think I've exceeded my expectations that I play until the very end, which I do, but I didn't. Right. And that I wasn't going to like compare myself to my opponent. I was going to play my game. They were going to play their game and the winner would be whoever and the loser, the second. So it was like, this was a great experience for me of growing even though a lot of people that I work with, they feel if they lose, it's a loss. And to me, anytime we get it wrong, anytime we miss something, it's a learning experience. And we would have been told that, Chuck, since we were kids. It's like, <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. It's like you learn from your losses. But yeah, you know yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't think our parents and our teachers really, really like encourage that. Right. They say it, yeah. but they don't. They don't invest enough time in just really explaining what we mean. It's like, you know, it's a gift when you lose. It's a gift when you lose for you to learn more. Bob, I raised so, four children and two of them played Little League Baseball. And I was both just astounded and disturbed at the level of pressure that parents put on an eight-year-old kid who gives up a home run. The, the, the shame, the, the pressure they feel to get back onto that mound, they just want to, want to crawl into a hole and go away. So what do we do about societal and parental expectations, even at a young age, that make us feel less than if we're not winning and we didn't get drafted by the New York Yankees or we didn't make it through the pro tennis circuit? What do you say to those parents? Let, let, let's, and, and, and let, let's, let's go there. In, in your book is intended for just about anybody that, that wants to change themselves. But what do you say to the people where the rest of the world is telling them who they are and they're not telling it to themselves? Well, write a good book and get it in their hands, I think. But like when I work with kids, I still work with a lot of kids in tennis, although it's not my main thing. I love working with kids and I get on the phone with them and when I first meet them, I tell the parents, look, you're, you're very well intentioned. You all kind of have a lot of really good insights. You know, you might be good at this particular thing that your child's trying to do, play the piano or play a tennis match or whatever it is. You have good insights, but you have to understand that you need to turn it over to somebody who's not as invested in the outcome, but is more invested in the growth of the, of the student or the player or the, the child, that the great coaches are working on these kids being great human beings first right. and being great pianists or violinists or, or, or runners. Professional I mean, tennis players. <laughs> or professional tennis players because how many people become number one in the world in tennis? How many people become number one? Like Anything. so true. <laughs> right. So the emphasis on that becomes like, a, to me, it's a negative. Right. Where if the emphasis is on let's make sure that your child is becoming a better version of themselves for all the things they're going to do in their life, including the piano or tennis. Right. And they will, they will walk away from their experiences of winning and losing, which happens all the time. Look, in finance, you know, you're oh, telling people all the time, hey, if you're really good, you get by 53% of the time. That's a good year. It's like, that is a really good year. 54%, you're like, a superstar yeah. and if you're a baseball player you know you might get a lot of good hits but if the guy's standing right where you hit the ball it's an out 
Yeah, so, well, I, I want to conclude and I want to give our listeners, I'm going to raise the book for those watching this on YouTube. And I loved this book. It's called Live the Best Story of Your Life. And Bob Litwin is our guest. He is the author of this book. He has taken years of research, of coaching at such high performance levels. I'll also say that his forward to my Wall Street listeners and many of my clients, Joel, Glee, Joel Greenblatt, my Columbia colleague, he teaches in the business school. He wrote a great book I use when I teach finance called The Little Book That Still Beats the Market. You know, that, that, that just phenomenal, this simplicity and accessibility, very similar to what you did for performance change, Bob. So let's, 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 you speak directly to our listeners, to the Wall Streeters out there, to my Columbia students. What do you want them to do after they read your book? What do you want them to do with it as it relates to their story? Well, first of all, Joel Greenblatt wrote the forward. To I know he did. And I loved reading it because he, he wrote in his accessible and, style. It was great. Yeah. Yeah. So what Joel realized, and this is what I guess I would want to put out there, is that you that it's not all about the money that you make, that there are a lot of lessons out there that you can learn that will contribute to you feeling very, very successful in your life, in addition to making a lot of money. Right. So it's not that I'm saying to people who are you know, in finance, like, you need better balance and this, I'm not saying that. All I'm saying is like, what is it in your life that's not working? Whether it be at work, whether it be at home, whether it be with yourself, whether it's in your community, what is it that's not working? And if you can identify what's not working, it is not that difficult for you to fix that in some way. I don't know if the word is fixed, but you can transform yourself. Right. And so when you go to work in the day, if you go in and you're like pretty, pretty solid at managing stress, you're going to have a better day at work. You still might make a great play and the market might go against you but you come home and you feel differently at the end of the day. And then that contributes to like this domino effect of like things are better at home right. and that you're not feeling like I don't have time to work out I, or I've got to eat and run. Or it's like all the things that seem to make life more difficult are available to shift. Mm -hmm. So my emphasis with people is like, who are you? Are you okay with who you are? If you are great, you don't need to do any work with me. But if you <laughs> right. think there's something. I recommend you, reading the book. <laughs> Yeah, but you know, I mean, look, uh, I know that some people might read my book and think it's like a lot of hooey, but like, I also know that maybe four years later, it might be a fall off their bookshelf and hit them on the head and they go like, oh, now at this point in my life, I realize, you know, maybe I'll write my story. So I'm always saying the same thing. Write your old stories. You don't have to write a long narrative. It can be like bullet points. You can draw a picture if you want. As soon as you write your old stories, take a look at it and say like, is this okay? No? Okay, good. Flip the stories. Even if they're totally a fabrication, write a new story of yes, of possibility of who you could be. And once you've done that, the fun work really starts, which is keep your eyes open all day long for these opportunities to push back against an old story that was planted unintentionally in your brain, started to grow. It's who you think you are, but it's not. You are not you're not stuck with who you were. You and can you, be who you, you want to be. You reinforce the concept that often our lives are defined by the opportunities that we both take advantage of and that we miss. It, it was interesting how you wrote about both these opportunities. Are you in the mindset to be able to confront that opportunity and to leverage it? Or is your mindset telling you, no, to skip it? When, if your story is right, well, Chuck, you know, I mean, I wrote in the book, it starts off with the fact that I'd lost my wife 10 years, like 11 years ago now, and that I had a really bad story about like, I'm going to get old, alone, and I'm not going to be able to handle the surgery. I need to do it. I had a bad story going on. But I also knew, and especially when she was sick, I knew this is an opportunity for me to outperform myself. Right. I can either like fall on my face right now with this like disappointing thing that's going on in our lives. She was the one who was sick. Yeah. And I was like sick with her in that way. And I knew this is like an opportunity. And I felt like all the training I had done for tennis and everything, what I realized was, oh, all that training I was doing, it was for this match, right. to be a winner in this match. And I felt that my growth during her illness and her passing away was the greatest growth that I had ever had. And I wrote in the book, specifically that was one of the great things that happens in my life i don't mean great good 
but great in that I was able to like have this really, really difficult, awful thing that happened. And I was able to like be there and be present and be strong and stay fit and stay healthy mentally and be a model. And I was glad for having to do that. I was glad for it. And also I ended up living new stories afterwards that are wonderful stories and my life is great even though I had this like really tragic thing that happened in my life I lost this person who was just amazing yeah. you know my my soulmate so well, it's very heartfelt it's opportunity. these are the opportunities we have and almost every time it's tough these are the gifts these are the opportunities it's like that book the alchemist every uh, single no, thing that's, that's, that's the guy, world rewards your uncertainty yeah, yeah, either like you're tripping over all these things or you're saying like, oh, wait, these are things that I need to go through over around in order to become better, to really find my treasures. Indeed. And Bob, to our listeners, where do they find you? Uh, they can go to boblitman.com. That's my website. I have all these journals that are there that I write. Really good. Um, that's the best place to get me. And that's how they can contact me. And uh you know, just even if they never meet me or read my book or anything, after they get off this this really nice interview, think about writing a few things that you know block you a little bit. Yeah. And then experiment with rewriting those and see how it goes. I think as soon as you write your old story, you see this story, you're already going to be on your way. Yeah, and I appreciate that. And, you know, part of the advice for Bob and I collaborating on this is we think about your wheel of change as you listen Think about the four different things in your life. What I, my model is, write down one thing you want to create, one thing that you want to preserve, one thing that you want to eliminate, and lastly, one thing that you are willing to accept. Bob catalogs it in his own way in his wonderful book, Live the Best Story of Your Life. So Bob Litwin, I know you're coming to us from the heels of a tennis match where you played in 100 degree heat. And it's great to see you well recovered. And thank you for bringing your wonderful work into the universe and for going to work every day in the service of someone else's success. We really appreciate that. Well, Chuck, thank you so much. That really means a lot. I get chills when somebody says something like that. And I, uh, I'm, and I'm going to be better tomorrow than I am today for somebody and for myself. For those and I am grateful for the work that you do for so many. We have some mutual friends and what a wonderful thing it is. And to our listeners, thank you very much for tuning in to Climber, CLMBR.com. Thank you for your sponsorship. You're a great partner. And Bob Litwin, keep playing great tennis. Keep making a difference in other people's lives. And thank you so much for contributing to a climb to the top. My pleasure. And uh, good night, everyone. I'm Chuck Garcia. You can see me at ChuckGarcia.com. This is a climb to the top stories of transformation and good night. Rotating those hands all the way up. Nice control. Right,